And do we need to call the meeting? Yeah. Correct. Hey, could I have a motion to convene the Berlin Boylston Regional School District? So move. You, you don't think you just, you're just going to call it to order? You just call it to order as a chair. As a chair. I call it to order. I would like to call. Because I'm the chair. <laughs> I'd like to call the Boylston School uh, Committee meeting to order. I'd like to call the Berlin School Committee to order. Okay, okay we're in Let's order. Roll. <laughs> um, consent agenda, September 13th, open session minutes. Is there any discussion? Could we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? <laughs> so moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Communications. We did receive a communication from a community member asking some very good questions regarding regionalization. Um, the questions were answered, but it also raised for us the fact that there are additional mechanisms that people could use if they want to um, get information or provide opinions and thoughts about regionalization, which is going to be an ongoing topic <coughs> for a bit, that you can also provide information through the school councils, which is a, a part of their um, role as well, and the school council would then provide feedback for the superintendent. <laughs> Are there any petitions and audiences related to items on the agenda? Okay. We, I will make a note that we're going to move the agenda around a little bit. In a couple minutes, we're going to let the teachers go first and share some information. Actually, I shouldn't say first. We're going to go through part of the agenda and then, but we're moving you up in the agenda <laughs> to an earlier time. <laughs> Um, Tonto student member, Grace, do you have a report for us? Sure. So after the successful spirit meet and homecoming for the high school students, we have begun to plan our annual meeting, which will take place this Thursday. This requires several departments and groups to plan and organize. We will have the music department put on their stag lounge, which consists of live music from the students and teachers, as well as refreshments. Um, we will also have the art classes presenting their painted pumpkins, and the student council will put on the bonfire outside in the haunted hallway indoors. The senior class would like to thank the PTO and all the parents for putting on the wonderful senior breakfast. The National Honor Society would like to thank everyone who donated to the cafe last month in support of Alzheimer's research. The cafe will be continued on the last Friday of each month to support a group in need. The NHS has also been fundraising for breast cancer awareness during the month of October by collecting money at lunch and wearing our pink shirts on Wednesdays. The annual Cape trip was also a big success for AP Bio, AP Chem, AP Literature, Nature of Being, and Independent Art classes. 38 students attended and all will agree that the trip was nothing but a positive experience. Our fall sports are coming into their last, week, last few weeks of their seasons. The field hockey team took the title of undefeated league champions. Uh, the girls soccer team came in second in their league. Boys soccer stands at a, I think now, 3-6-4 and four record and will have to work hard in the spot for districts. Cross country has also been doing well. Both girls soccer and field hockey will be going to districts. Very good. Thank you, Grace. Yeah, Grace, very thorough. Thank you. <coughs> so it's Thursday night, is Thursday this week, right? The bonfire. I think it's supposed to rain, actually. So mm -hmm. we're not going to do about that. We probably keep everything that's going on indoors. And we'll see about the bonfire. But Fingers crossed. Yeah. A little bit of rain probably wouldn't be a bad thing. Keep a little water under control. I love the, the thing I <coughs> saw on social media to haunted. <laughs> that was cute. <laughs> to haunted hallway. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Snow on Thursday. Um, how about CPAC? Hi. 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 Um, I'm Rochelle Fred. I'm um, Boylston, co-president of the CPAC. Um, just a couple things, this is my first meeting. We uh, skipped the night before school. <laughs> um, we started the new year with a full executive board, which is pretty cool. We haven't had that in a while. Usually, we're kind of juggling goals, and now we can just share the wealth. So um, we had our first meeting in September here at our meeting week. And we want to thank all the staff and teachers and parents who came and uh, helped out. 
Uh, we have a full scheduled presentation set for the school year, and we're actually excited because we'll be offering some topics that staff and parents have suggested to us, um, such as the mind, body, movement, or brain gym type stuff. So we're kind of we're glad, we, and we always want feedback if you have any suggestions. Um, and tomorrow night, we'd like to invite you all to attend a presentation on pandas. Now, it's not as cute as it sounds. It's, um, <laughs> it's pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders associated with streptococcal infection. <laughs> so, if you want to know more about that, <laughs> come by um, Berlin at, uh, in the library at 7 o'clock tomorrow. And that's it. BMS Library, right? Yes. The great school library. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Boylston PTO. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi. I'm Gail Wani, co-chair Boylston PTO. Uh, so I'll give an update uh, by going back to the end of last year and our big Race for Education fundraiser. We met our goal of $20,000 for the playground and we donated $25,000 which included four new pieces of playground equipment, a shade, a buddy bench, and all new mulch. And I believe Principal Thompson gave an update about the, how the whole playground installation went and I, I don't want to repeat myself but it was just like the cliche it takes a village. We had so many people helping out from the support of all of you and the selectmen and Principal Thompson and Christine and Matt Doyle, who donated all their time with organizing it, and Matt Doyle's company donating their time and equipment and getting us the mulch at a good price. So it really, really came together. It was a big relief when it was over. <laughs> and so this year we're starting off, we uh, completed our fall fundraiser, and so far we've raised about $5,100, and I think that will add, uh, bump up a little bit more because there's, um, reach out booklets that get mailed out to people and, and that money will trickle in soon. Uh, the next thing we're doing is uh, we're doing our ta talent show that we usually do in the spring but we moved it to the fall because the spring is very busy with events and sports and since the gym isn't quite ready at BES yet, Principal Tusari has generously offered to let us use the auditorium so that's going to be exciting for the kids this year. So I'd like to thank you for letting us Use that. That might and become a new tradition, Gail, if it goes really well. Yeah. <laughs> Throw it out there. The kids feel like it's like going to Broadway. Right. The <laughs> <laughs> talent show going Broadway at the Hunt Up. Right. <laughs> and uh, then uh, next year, the beginning of the year, we'll have our our dance again. That we that was something else we moved from the spring to the winter and we made it more of a family dance instead of just like a father daughter. It was just families bring whoever you know, that special person in their life, and that was really popular last year. We got a lot of positive feedback about that, and just going like through the whole year. I mean, in general, we're going to be supporting STEM like we did last year. Jennifer Stander is going to get some assemblies in where it was more of a one-on-one. -on -one. Each classroom had their own personal assembly, which worked out great last year. They liked that. And we're also supporting the teachers, working with them for other assemblies that are not STEM related. So whatever, you know, if they bring something up that sounds great, we'll support it. And then we just sprinkle in teacher appreciation things during the year and we celebrate in May with our National Teacher Appreciation Day. We always do a big thing for them. So that's pretty much it. Thanks Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Gail. Is there a representative from Link here? Ooh, Suzanne's not here, but um, did you hear any updates? Yet? Um, well, I guess um, I one of the things I would say that one of the things that we've done this year that we're probably most proud of is we're able to keep jazz band alive. Um, so um, that's a big thing for us. Uh, of course, now I'm nervous. So I'm blanking on. Uh, <laughs> 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 Sorry, Val. Um, our uh, Teacher's name. Um, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Sort of want. Gosh, I don't know why I did that. But anyway, so we're doing that. Um, we're trying to put more money into our maker space. We're thinking about not doing science programs this year, but getting uh, the mobile STEM museum into the school for the day. It's just an idea we're throwing about. Um, 
we made almost, well, about $1,500 on our Shardner Farms event. And we've got a couple more things coming up, but it's pretty much business as usual. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, I think I'd rather I'll, I'll do my report afterwards. I, I think it would be great. I see we have um, Lisa and Peter here, and I'd like to give them the opportunity to talk about their scores um, and their progress that they've, they've made. Um, okay. Well, I will. Um, so, I'm Lisa Sinclair, and um, Science Department Chair to Hanto. And I think you guys, I um, sent along the whole report to you yes. prior to um, um, coming this evening. So the report is a combination of three items for the eighth grade um, science and technology scores for 2016, and the um, second three are um, for the high school biology um, for 2016. And each of the groupings have an achievement by year, which is a really nice um, graphic snapshot of what's happened over the past four years. And also each test is, represent, um, is represented by results, by standards, which I think is really important um, in understanding when we're assessing um, the curriculum and the frameworks and how our students are doing and if there are any um, particular holes or gaps that we need to adjust for, <coughs> um, which there really are none. If, you know, if you actually if you look at the scores, and then for planning purposes, we essentially use the test item analysis as a very specific tool to look at each of the test items and reflect on the student's performance in um, on those particular items, and we particularly look at the open response questions and understanding how, because that seems to be where we have to support the students, um, particularly with a variety of needs. Um, the open response tends to be where the needs are. If you look at all of the information provided by the, um, for the eighth grade um, science and technology scores, they did very, very well, 66% of all students scoring proficient and advanced, um, whereas our state average was 41%, and that's in that um, bar graphic. And I think um, the, second, the second set of information results by standard for the eighth grade, it's this long list of the standards that are tested on the eighth grade. And I think that's really an important document to look at to understand the breadth of the, eighth, the science and technology um, test in eighth grade. They're tested on so many different standards. And the, um, the success really from, for the past several years, um, three years essentially, has come, the department has worked very hard at creating a review program in the eighth, um, just prior to taking, where they rotate through all the curriculum areas, and that's proven very successful because it's very difficult. They um, learn all the topics, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, and technology and engineering, um, and are tested. And uh, on top of everything that's going on with them personally, hormones, everything else, to all, all of that, and then to test on all four of those <coughs> areas. And they're um, showing a lot of um, progress and um, excellent achievement. For the high school, um, they did phenomenal. I was so very proud of our high school students. Um, you can see the bar graph that um, everyone passed. Uh, the graph shows that we have 95% of students achieving an advanced and proficient and you know, really maintaining that's um, a little different because the curriculum is divided in one year predominantly. There's a small group of students who receive the curriculum in two years. Um, and I think that the success of the program is because of the alignment of the frameworks and the students' needs. And that's all combined in a very clear fashion um, for the students, for um, you know, to so that they can achieve um, and 
do very well for that graduation requirement. Um, we use the um, item analysis again to see if there's any gaps or holes, anything that we can. You know, I, I say we, it's me. It's not a department. I am. Um, the past couple of years, we've tried to get people in to help me out. <laughs> And it's me. <laughs> so I, I, I try to be really political and just say, oh, you know, mm. but no. Yeah, I, I, I work really, really, really hard in making sure that the kids know what they need to do. I assess them. I talk to them. We go over the material. I, I, can, I can do it at a high level. I can have them play with Play-Doh. And by the end of the year, they're all getting it. So um, I'm really proud of the students. They work really hard. And um, I, I'm, you know, I, it's a privilege to work with the students. Um, and I sincerely believe that. Um, any questions? Looks like you've done a nice job. Thank, Thank you. you. I, awesome. I just want to actually make a comment, um, is that Lisa has also, we have the new science standards. And Lisa has done an unbelievable job in, in working with our elementary staff as well. And I appreciate that. So thank you very much for, for doing, going it's, well above and beyond in, in helping the teachers and aligning those new standards, understanding them, and knowing how they're going to be met up here in middle high schools and, and how we can keep that vertical alignment because I think that's what we've missed for so long. So. I think that's really important to adoption of the new standards that each grade level has their own standards to work with and it's the the span level standards are gone and I think it makes it a much more feasible program um, vertically um, to work with and it's I think it's a little bit on my part a little selfish opportunity so I can understand what's happening so I can understand the language and kind of use some of the elementary school tools and language <coughs> when I'm working with my freshmen to activate prior knowledge because they're like for a lot. And this is joking. I know at the elementary school teachers who are here. I would say to some of my kids, okay, so when we do this open response, we get a paragraph like, like you know, the hamburger style paragraph, and the kids are like, like that's so 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> So I really needed some language skills too to understand and help me because there's always new buzzwords, um, and I feel very privileged. Um, there's um, we have a, an incredible district-wide staff, and it's a real um, pleasure to work with them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If I could just also just add a couple of, of things, um, you know, it's, I think. Lisa jokes about the fact that it's just her, but um, unlike any one of the other MCAS tests, the science tests are specific to either biology or um, physics or chemistry, and our students choose to take biology. And you know, Lisa is correct. We have tried um, over the past couple of years to sort of hand that. Um, position off in one way or another, um, but it has never really worked out the way that, that we have hoped, and in every single case, Lisa has stepped up as, um, you know, the former biology teacher and or the, the science department head, and has really stepped in and made, you know, an incredible difference in um, these students' lives related to um, biology, and I'd just like to hope she's done an incredible job um, with the kids and, and with the staff as well, and it is because of her that the school does perform so well in its biology on CAS, so thank you. So I can follow up, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> As well as uh, Lisa did, I said some things along to make sure I'll put them in your packets. Um, very simply, our students did very well. Again, we had 99% of our students score advanced and proficient, um, with only one student scoring that needs improvement. Uh, you can see we had 74% of our students score advanced, which is outstanding. Um, so we're hitting all the standards that we should be hitting. So again, my English department is very proud of it. 
continuing to do really well with that. Um, so I just have a few other charts I'd like to go over. Um, this shows our growth and achievements. Um, this is the state <coughs> Obviously, 50% is the median for growth, but that's achievement level there. And Tahato again consistently scores um, high as far as growth and achievement. Um, next one. <coughs> this is how the 10th uh, grade has done over the last couple of years in MCAS. You can see again um, just numbers that I'm real proud of with our English department um, consistently scoring. Um, we have a large portion of our students scoring advanced and consistently near the top of the state with how many of our students are scoring advanced. And the last chart. This is the class history. Uh, so the class of, what are these guys, 2018. Um, and this is how they have fared through the years. Um, this last chart here shows how many of our students have moved into the advanced category by 10th grade. So any questions right now? On, this is MCAS. Park is its own animal. I'll talk about that a little bit. <coughs> Peter, I think, oh, did somebody else have a question? Um, between grades 8 and 10, what exactly is happening there? They grow up. <laughs> <laughs> really, it, it's, it's, there's a lot to be said about that. It's In 8th grade, 8th grade is a weird year <laughs> for people. You think about psychologically what's going on with them. How important is standardized testing to them? They get a lot of standardized testing throughout their lives. So at 13, 14 years old, it's not going to count for anything, right? Tenth grade is when it becomes the reality of graduation requirement. And that does factor in. When they suddenly start to hear that, I could see the, their change in attitude about it when I start to talk about it in the show. Hey, look, you don't pass this. You don't get your diploma. This is what you have to do. This is what there is that that happens. Plus, it's just their maturity. As far as their ability to read well and write well, all those things. It just comes into play. If you went to other school districts, would you see that same kind of leap from eighth grade to 10? I don't know. I haven't studied <coughs> other school districts in that sense. Um, I could if you want me to, I'd rather not. <laughs> 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 I barely have enough time as it is now. Yeah, no, um, not necessarily. I don't know, I don't know the curious. answer to that. I do know, if you look at, I put together a chart a couple of years ago looking at state numbers. The state numbers have been increasing. Like, if you look at um, the first chart I pulled up, I think it's the state's now 92% advanced and proficient. For about five or six years ago, that was not the case. I remember in 2008, we made a big jump uh, with the amount of our students scoring advanced, and we've remained at that level since 2008. And the state has been slowly catching up. But I don't know um, the answer to that as far as how other districts fare in that jump from eighth grade to tenth grade. Peter, I could um, jump in. Sure. The, these scores are always, I'm always astounded by the English scores, the um, language arts scores. Um, and this is wonderful representation of what happens in tenth grade. I think what is really important and addictive what happens at Tahanto is um, that kind of organic data that we collect from the students once they graduate um, and hearing how so often I hear from students that return say, we were so prepared, we were so well prepared, kids don't know how to write, we, we blew everything out of the water. They, our students feel a step ahead of the game when they enter college. And I think that's um, especially with the foundation of um, English and math is essential on um, um, what's happening here. And there's no hard data for that other than just testimony from um, kids writing us emails and talking and saying, you know, we're so much better off. And they can't believe, sometimes they can't believe what the other kids are writing. <laughs> kind of like, ah! you know. <laughs> I think that's important. Thank you. Um, park death. So maybe Ian and Diane can help me out on this one. There's not a lot um, that we can get our hands on at this point in time. Specifically, the, the data that's missing is how we fare as a grade, how eighth grade fares on each one of the standards. They don't have any of that available yet. And that's really, I think, the most important. I can get a student report 
um, for each student individually and see how they did in the three writing sections and the two reading sections. But again, where it matches up for each standard, they don't have that type of information yet. With MCAS, they do. The, the data that's available for MCAS is endless. You can spend hours and hours and hours just finding different reports, breaking it down. How did each student do on this particular question, which matches up with this particular standard? And that type of analysis is really important, and it helped me a lot uh, when we started MCAS, what, in 98, 1998? So in those first couple of years, it was just me in the corner with a CD and paperwork, firing through that stuff. That helped a lot with uh, setting up the sophomore curriculum, but we don't have that type of information available to us yet for PARC, um, which is, I think the state really needs to get on that. Mm -hmm. uh, what we do have available to us is how each grade uh, scores as far as level five, which is the highest achievement level down to level one. Um, the, the state wants to see our students in level four and level five, that's what they consider to be passing. Level three is approaching, level two is close. I don't quite have the Good. terminology memorized yet. Um, so we can get this type of information. They are making some more reports available to us as far as um, how all of our students have done, but then break it down into subgroups so we can start to take a look at how our special ed population has done. Um, but I don't quite, I don't, I don't have that material for you tonight. But what I put together here in this, it's just a spreadsheet I put together for my own benefit uh, to take a look at 2016, how our different grades did and our uh, numbers, and then 2015 comparatively. So then I like to take a look. I love looking at class history because you know it's easy to say, hey, well, in eighth grade last year they scored here, in eighth grade this year they scored here. Two totally different groups of kids. So we really need to pay, I think it's most important to pay attention to the graduating class numbers. And you can see here from, from uh, 2015 to 2016, we have a little bit of shuffling here, but as far as percentages, we have 58%. They've stayed exactly the same as far as the amount of students in level four and level five. So we can see that that's kind of where this class is. And this is a class that you know we're gonna to have to take a look at. That's our current freshman. Mm -hmm. right, so that's a group that we need to take a good look at and do some more analysis as far as where those strengths and weaknesses are in the curriculum and try to address that. Um, you can see here in 2021, same type of thing, um, as far as a percentage of students scoring in level four and level five, it's, you know, statistically insignificant. Again, you look at percentages. In the class of 2022, we can see the same thing. There was a little bit of a jump. Um, Berlin and Boylston both had a 68% in fifth grade. Um, and now in sixth grade, our current seventh graders scored 78 percent of their class were in the level four, level five, which is, I think, it's pretty good. Um, and again, this is just what we have available to us at this point in time. <clears throat> These are just all fancy graphs of all this information. Just, so, Peter, just it helps me. I like to put the visual. One of the myself. questions I know, like Tom, you had asked at our last school committee meeting, was, you know, where are we seeing the difference? growth, but right there in, in regards to having the sixth grade mm -hmm. regionalized up here, um, it, we can't really, and you'll hear a little bit later on, we can't, it's not really apples for apples per se of what the sixth graders were like before. Peter and I kind of talked about this uh, yesterday, right Peter, and it, you know, it, it, it's not the same data of when they were in sixth grade, it was MCAS, now it's PARC. Um, and if you look at where they were individually, you're looking at separate um, entities and now trying to look at where they are as a whole, it's hard to say because it's not uh, equally, there's no equal distribution between Berlin and Boylston. It's hard. It's the closest thing that we could really show that would show we, we can't compare how the sixth graders did before when they were in second grade, but you can see where this group as a whole averaged when they were in fifth grade versus where they're averaging as a sixth grade as a whole and it, it's gone up 10%. Like that, that's the closest thing we can really get to that type of information to make it true information, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's, you can't compare MCAS data to PARC data. It's just two very different tests. And I don't even know what the state, the state hasn't really decided what we're gonna do in the spring yet. They're calling it MCAS 2.0. Right. And from I, uh, Bill Whitehead, uh, and Alexis Maynard and I took a course this past summer, right? Was it the summer? Yeah. On yeah. MCAS 2.0, it was put together just to try to figure out what the state's going to do. The state doesn't really know yet. Um, they think it's going to be like PARC, but just with a new name so people aren't scared of it. 
-hmm. That's the way I look at it too. It's going to be on the computer. It's a semantic game. It will be computerized, just like Park was. It'll be the same. Made by the same company. Same same type of questions as Park. It just has a different label, so that the height kind of slows down. When you say that they haven't broken this into different topics yet, do you mean like? In the spring, though, when they do the new park, the no, new MCAS, sorry. What Peter's talking or, about is, and I think what you're referring to is like in regards to the MCAS data, what we could do is we right. could look at the question and we could say that standard, boy, we need right. to reteach that standard as a classroom whole, or right. this group of students didn't understand this particular standard. With park, we're just getting an overall score of the student. We're right. not getting an actual this standard we were weak, this standard we were strong. We just know in within this area of literacy. Where we score. But it's not a full. St it's not the individual standards. So you're going to get that data for this past testing cycle at all, or something we, we hope they do? We're still waiting to hear from the department what they're going to give us. It's, it, this is oh. what we get from the Department of Education and what they put on our what we call our security portal, so that and Peter and the department heads, I think we see you do yeah, right, yeah, have yeah, access yeah. to the actual security portal, so they can pull up the confidential information about individual students. Mm. I mean, but there, part there is a, us that. a great amount of information for MCAS in very little time. Mm -hmm. I was yeah. just doing some digging on the state website and I just happened to come across this Excel spreadsheet that they have put together. You have to download it. It's a gigantic file, but I can call it for the Boylston, and it will break down for us how we've done grades 6 through 8 mm -hmm. as a whole, mm -hmm. and that's it. And then you can break it down by subgroups. You can take a look at the subgroups again with um, male, female, right. uh, races, and things like that. So you get a little bit of information, but that's still not showing us where we are with standards. And again, I can call up I, uh, the student roster, or I can take a look at every single individual student. Obviously, I can't show that here, uh, but every single student, it will show us again. There are three writing categories, three writing categories, and two reading categories. But there's no further breakdown from that. Again, with MCAS, I can look at each individual question. They have a link to the actual test with the question, with the um, standard that's linked to it, how the student answered, how we fared as a, as a school. Um, okay, for every single question, where we ranked in comparison to the rest of the state on this particular question. Really valuable information. Hey, where's our weaknesses? Where's our strengths? We've got to assure this up. We're doing really well here. None of that's available to us for Park. And that is, so they're asking us to accomplish all this and do all these things, but without the data to help us figure it out. Mm -hmm. So a lot of teachers are flying blind in that. It's just, we got to figure this out as we go along. And that's very typical of how the state operates with this type of thing. They do this. It's like, here's you've got to do this. Well, how are we going to do it? You figure it out, and then we'll tell you when you're wrong. <laughs> Great. And the kids are suffering in the meantime. That's the thing that gets under my skin about mm -hmm. all this. Okay. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, thank Peter. You. And, and thank again, you, Peter. I want to thank Peter for always going above and beyond and helping us, even with the, the literacy we're putting together. We're trying to restructure and redefine the literacy plan. And <coughs> Carol and I met with Peter, and, and Bill actually sat with us as well. And we're hoping to sit with um, Rich Starziak at the middle school as well to look at that. But you know, we want to look at our revisions and, and what we need to do. Are we aligning ourselves, continuously aligning ourselves with, with the standards? Um, just like we're looking at science this year, we have looked at English before, but now we've had three solid years of implementation. So now we're saying, okay, where are our tweaks and where do we redefine and so forth? So again, Peter, thank you as, as well for all of your work. And I just want to say thank you to the school committee administration again for um, allowing us to go on that cake trip. It was, it was phenomenal this year. The kids, what an amazing group of students and children that you have. Just what a great weekend. Right. It, was, it, was, it, was, it was it was awesome. Fantastic. And um, because we were able to reach out and have such an early connection with the Atlantic White Shark um, Conservancy, uh, we were the first student group. Yeah, four years ago. We were one of the first ago, schools we to contact them. We were in the first student group. So they have grown in their programming and want to put together um, a, program, a program for young women in science and have a conference, and we're on the short list of invitees once they get that pulled together of high school and college students um, to work with current professionals in the New England Aquarium and scientists 
in the area. So it's really exciting, and it's, you know, your support and the interest of the um, students. They are were so engaged and asked so many incredible, whether it was with the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy or at the, um, the galleries or with Don Wilding at the Boston Society, they were incredible. So they really should be proud of our students. Just awesome. There were a couple of students that um, reported on it sort of informally who had gone last year as well and said they thought this year was phenomenal. There was some magic going on. I think it was the magic of the weather. Well, the weather was the magic. I did hear that too. Whales right off the beach. Oh, oh, oh my gosh. That was incredible. We were, we were coming down Mark Point Beach and then, and there were some people coming up and, and then we were like, you know, light on our stuff. And there they were, like often, there was a pod of whales just, you know, breaching and moving and then there were some seals going this way. It was... International uh, Space Station flew right <laughs> Stars were alive. Awesome. Well, we'll look forward to hearing more about that trip again here. Would you like another? Yes. We'd love it. We'd to try to pick up something new for you because we've kind of done the same presentation mm -hmm. for a few years. So okay. I put that task in. So you guys are creative enough. You've got to come up with something new. So they've already got something prepared. Just be prepared to participate. Ooh. So Ooh. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you both. Thank you. Yep, we'll go to my report and then you can see All right, so I'm going to start with my report. Um, I'd like to just talk to the school committee about... <coughs> yep. Um, okay, so I'd like to just talk really quickly about the um, October 1st enrollment. Uh, regarding any of the students that were enrolled, there's really not much difference than what we had spoken about at the beginning of the year. Uh, just very quickly, the couple of differences were uh, Berlin Memorial has one less student in grade two and one more student in grade three. Other than that, they're right on the status quo. Um, Boylston Elementary School has exactly the same as they've had from the very beginning of the year, so that's always great. As we stated earlier in the year, we want to make sure that we're watching um, grade one was a little bit higher than what we didn't know. It was kind of like the repeat of what current grade four is in grade one, but they stayed the status quo. I think at that time, if I recall, um, at this time of the year, at that point, we were already really nervous about the sizes, so we're, we're not at this time. Um, as well as um, at Tahanta, we have one less student in grade nine, but three more students in grade 12 than when we originally spoke. So um, that's it, our, our school choice numbers, one of the things that we do have to think about as we're planning is um, in grade 12, you have a high number of school choice students, but for the incoming sixth grade, we have a very low number of school choice students, so school choice funding will impact us actually not until we do our FY19 budget, which actually next year at this time, that's what we will be doing. So very early to be talking about it, but just wanted to put that as a, as a heads up. I also uh, wanted to talk a little bit about the, um, the uh, usage, the electrical usage update. <coughs> this past spring, I announced that we were doing four day weeks over the summer to determine how we were doing with our, um, just wanted to kind of do a little electrical check to see what we were doing, our town's offices. They work four days a week, and so we wanted to see what we did was we extended our typical summer hours, so longer hours, but only four days a week. So it was the same hours that we typically do over the summer. So didn't really save um, that much. Uh, in Berlin, we actually didn't save in regards to the wattage usage um, because Berlin actually went through a lot of um, maintenance over the summer, so it really wasn't a true assessment of any differential there. Uh, we had the, the stairs were done, we had um, and people there to be fixing. Um, help me out, John. Uh, uh, we Bob, we had everybody there for a couple of weeks. We had the stairs get done, we had the doors repaired. Right. So we had a 
had a lot of work that was actually <coughs> done at Berlin, so I think you'll see an overall savings um, in, in regards to the full year usage because of the maintenance work that was done over the summer. Um, and so what you, I'm also giving you is a cost differential from FY15 to 16, so our wattage um, usage, the cost is less in Berlin this year than it was last year. In Boylston, we actually used um, 460 on, this is the average, um, we actually saved on average 460 uh, wattage watts, kilowatt hours, I guess is what you say. Um, so we saved that in the, in the course of um, July and August of this summer. So that was a huge savings um, in regards to the um, kilowatt hours. However, our cost for our electrical use has gone up this year from last year. So you don't see as much of a cost savings, but imagine if we didn't save that wattage kilowatt hours, what it would have cost you. So it was still some savings. At Tahanto, um, we saved a little bit of um, kilowatt hours on average. This is not the total hours, but it was the average per day. Um, and so um, the cost was very little, but again, there was some work done in some of the buildings this year. So it, I think it was a good exercise and very interested in doing it again and entertaining it to see, but I just wanted to give you an update because we had talked about that before. Um, substitute teacher rate. I'm not proposing a change for this year, clearly because our budget is already um, in, in use, but for FY18, um, I have met with some of our substitute teachers in our district regarding the daily rate and a bunch of other um, situations with um, substitutes among the buildings and those were addressed to all of our building administrators. However, um, when I first started here in 2012, we had moved the rate to um, $75 a day for anybody who has worked more than 10 days. Otherwise, the first nine days, it's $65, and then once you go up to 10 days, it's $75. We haven't done any changes, but the minimum wage is going to be changing in January. And I would like to, uh, what I did do is I asked other districts where their rates were. Um, they ranged anywhere from 70 to 95 to $100 a day. Um, so we are within the range of $75 a day, but I would like to increase that to $80 a day as a flat rate, not whether you've worked one to nine days and then 10 days and then it rolls over. The majority of our subs are here already getting the 75. So I would just, it's not a big increase, but I would like to uh, increase that rate to $80 a day. Now I could do one of two things. I could put that on a future agenda item where you vote on it, but if you're comfortable with it, then you could vote on it this evening. But it would be in effect next year. In effect for FY18, so we can do our budget planning process with the anticipation that it's the additional cost per day. Uh, I would be willing to act on it okay. tonight. Um, I'd be willing to make a motion that we do that. Yeah. I think it makes a lot of sense to, to not do the 10 day bit. I, I just think that's a good idea. <coughs> so I'm happy to vote on it tonight too. Okay, could we have a motion to Approved? We do. I'll make that motion. Is there a second? <coughs> I would second. <laughs> Before you die. <laughs> Quick, take the vote. <laughs> you don't want to lose the quorum. Yeah. <laughs> as long as it's priorities. <laughs> you see how compassionate we are? Yeah. Just like home. <laughs> okay, is there any discussion? No. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Got okay, you're all set now, Matt. You guys are awesome. All right, next, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, CopSync, I wanted to give you an update. CopSync is actually a um, 911 safety platform. And we have been working very closely with the Berlin Police Department and the Boylston Police Department as well in um, identifying a safety protocol that we can have in our district where the police would also have access 
Um, so let's say we have an intruder that would come into the school. We can use it on our devices, on our computers, and our cell phones, our laptops, our iPads, our Chromebooks, all that good fancy terminology that is um, so we can so we can um, I look over at Paul. So we could have the access on our devices. We can actually um, set it off to state that there's an intruder and alarm, it would instantly go to the police department. And then we can follow that up with a message. So all the employees, all the teachers and so forth, they can be in their classrooms and on the screen, it can just show up on the screen and they'll know immediately because whoever's doing it could say is going into the blue wing or is going into um, second grade wing or whatever. And so now the police also will know exactly where that person is. Um, also, it can be for anything, like any kind of a 911 safety. It doesn't necessarily have to be that. That's just an example. Say we have somebody that's going into cardiac arrest, we can notify it right away. It triggers and then it will come. Um, it also allows monitors, so the police can also have monitor devices. Um, so this is a grant, so I just wanted to let you know uh, Carol has worked very closely also with the, the chief and with Marty McNamara, um, the chief in, in Berlin. He's the one who writes, wrote the grant, right? Wrote the grant for Berlin? Yep. And for the Boylston grant, um, Carol worked with uh, Chief Galvin for the language terminology to make sure that they were similar and um, has submitted it. Marty McNamara uh, from uh, our Boylston town administrator uh, signed off with the approval of that as well. So we're hoping to uh, receive those grants. And these, this grant is actually, there's two grants. Um, and we're hoping that uh, we will find out soon. And this is sponsored through Maya, the Insurance Association. So we can get the coverage to the municipalities, but not at the region for the school. So the region will pay for their portion of that, um, that capacity. So, but I just want to give you an update on that. Um, flashing lights at Tahanto. Uh, I just want to publicly thank MassDOT for providing us with those blinking lights. I don't think we had an opportunity to, to say that publicly, um, but you also have a copy of a letter that I sent to uh, Barry Morian, who's the district operations engineer for MassDOT, thanking him on behalf of the district for um, getting that result. Also, um, I wanted to announce the music trip to China and this we would uh, need a vote. Um, we were going to have the China trip with our music department to go this April vacation. However, there are a lot of siblings that are already planning to go to either Par um, to France or to um, Hawaii. Hawaii. So we have decided to move the trip to April vacation of 2018. And uh, we, I had to get in touch with the um, commissioner of education in Shanghai and Alice approved that um, move for the following year. And um, so Jeff Peer, who has been considered the coordinator for this trip, actually has been in contact with EF Tours to get updated brochures and so forth. And those that were signed in already, if they're able to continuously go for next year, they would be able to just um, you know, move the funds into that, that trip. So I just need a vote to approve the new date, which would be the, the April vacation. Will they be uh, submitting the new forms? Right, the forms now will be updated all I would do date. is just, I would just attach the new date. I would just change the new date. <coughs> Any cost relations. change to the trip? So that we're still waiting for because it's further out. That was the other piece that um, parents actually were appreciative of the fact that um, we're able to extend it so that they can have a longer period of time to make the payments. Uh, we do not anticipate a much, uh, um, we do not anticipate a, a greater cost. If anything, it might be a reduction a little bit because it's so long, so far out. What do you mean a reduction? In, in the cost? Yeah. Because the, the cost of the trip, because it was just so quickly in April, the cost oh, of the oh. flights could be more. Oh, okay. So they think it might be less. Is there a motion to approve the new date for the trip to China? So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in, is there any discussion? Yeah. 
All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Um, I do realize that on the school, um, on the enrollment numbers, one of the items I did forget to mention was our homeschooled student population. We currently have eight students at Berlin Memorial uh, that would have attended Berlin Memorial that are homeschooled, seven at Boylston Elementary School and 17 at Tahanta, which is a total of 32 students. That's about average of what we typically um, have. Mm -hmm. between, it's usually between 30 and 40 students each year, somewhere around that range, so there's not really a large difference there. Um, we ask is um, I, we just want to remind the school committee members that we have NEASC is this Sunday at 1 o'clock. We will promptly be starting the uh, opening ceremony. Uh, I believe um, all of you are going to be interviewed on Sunday afternoon. Oh, excellent. So, <laughs> um, um, and I'm not sure if school committee got a copy of the NEASC reports. Not yet. <coughs> they, they're not for. They're not. No. Okay. Well, we'll so see we you Sunday. We will not, we will not receive, receive them until after the findings. Okay. Okay. Well, looking forward to Sunday. I bet. Um, regionalization and turnover rate. Um, Tom, I believe you had asked if I could get that information um, on the the data. I have been asking, um, I did email and ask Tom Scott, the executive director from MASS, and he actually stated that he wouldn't know how he could find that information in regards to regionalization versus not regionalization, if that would be um, a determining factor. Or, um, so he did send me an email back, and I can forward it to the, um, to the committee members in regards to what his response was. And basically his response was saying that it's not so much about the turnover that would really help factor um, your question about regionalization, but more about the quality of how your staff member feel valued of regionalization versus not regionalization. He said I would focus more on those types of qualities of how your staff feel valued more than and appreciated more than, um, you know, that's as a whole general, I guess, is what he's saying, not necessarily whether it's regionalized or not regionalized, but it's more about the culture. Um, because my understanding of the conversation, as I recall, is the assumption was being pushed forward that in a regionalized environment, we would have less turnover rate than in a non. So he's saying that there isn't really he's the data. He's saying he wouldn't even look up. at that as a correlation at all. He okay. would just say more or less just the culture of the environment is. Regardless if it's regional right. or not, it's more of a yep. culture of the work environment. Right. Okay. Yep, that's what he basically stated. Thank you. But you are. Just to clarify, this isn't in conjunction with turnover rate at the superintendent level. Yes? No? It, it just it was, overall. It was a general turnover rate of staff, staff right? Mm -hmm. There was the general assumption, right, that was put forward at the last time yeah, that we were discussing that there was higher because we weren't regionalized than if we were regionalized. My understanding of the context of that was related to central office more than Teachers sort of making a blanket yep. statement. Right. So I guess what we're saying is we we're not seeing it in either, right? right? There's no data to back, back that up. Right. Well, there is data available in Boylston to show that, so I'm not sure the question that was asked is really... So the way, I think, if I may, mm -hmm. I think that when we were talking about it at the last meeting, we were, I think, saying that there was so much administrative turnover and there was so much change and we were saying that, you know, if it was, the argument was if we were regionalized, that we would most likely see less of that because you would have probably less to do things three times and doing it once and so Tom had stated well could we try to find the data for that so that's what I was trying to do and so I asked Tom Scott uh, is there data out there to show those districts that did decide to regionalize you know prior to regionalization where they had to do so many at once was there a higher turnover than once they were regionalized was there less turnover and he said it's not so much that that you would see the turnover <coughs> the culture and it's more about the respect and it's more about so it doesn't matter if it's regionalized or not it's about the actual culture and sure. how people feel valued as individuals but I, 
I think a big piece of the argument that we have been discussing was the turnover at central office mm -hmm. specifically related to having three different districts and that's been our experience here right right yeah so I don't I don't think this says that isn't real do you know well, what I mean? it's not saying that that isn't real and it didn't happen but would if you were regionalized would it have changed so we were looking for external data that would say, you know, in other regions where, or other districts where it was regional and not, was there a correlation between regionalization having an impact on turnover? And what we're saying is that the data isn't there for that. So it's, it's other <coughs> factors. Our data, no, I, our data, but yeah. but no. I, I still don't think we're getting at the right issue. If you looked at other districts where they have three separate districts, and what has their turnover rate been historically versus a fully regionalized? That's a different question than just saying, does regionalization reduce turnover? I think the issue here was that we have multiple districts. I still don't think we have data that backs that up. But I don't think there's data that doesn't back it up. Mm -hmm. I think there's just no data. Right, so we can't make the assumption that that was the reason for turnover is what we're saying because there isn't data to back that up. You're looking for correlations outside just our one instance. Yes, our, but there could have been other conditions causing it here too. That's what we're, that's well, what the data was kind of looking, was helping back up that argument because I would read other things that had alluded to that also, but what we're trying to do is <coughs> look for data, facts that would back that up. Right, and, and I agree with you. There are multiple factors, right. yes. I'm sure, that played a role right. in every one. I just worry that the question that was asked may be broader than what you were really looking at because I don't think we're proposing that regionalization in and of itself reduces turnover. I think what we were looking at is because of the complexities of three separate districts and the, the multiple work that has to be done, it's a dissatisfier mm -hmm. on some level to central office staff. Therefore, in our case, there's been more turnover. But it's not the Is only that dissatisfier that, cause, that could cause it. That's what, correct. That, that's what that analysis has shown. Right? We can't, we can't draw the straight line because <coughs> we weren't regionalized. I don't know because we didn't ask that, that question. That. But we, we are regionalized anyway, partially, right? Right. So the, I, I'm just saying, if we really want to find out if there's data, I think the question has to be crafted differently. I think it has to be crafted at, are there other districts like us, where there are three districts, and all the resulting confusion? Mm -hmm. and you could try to go after th that data. I think what we have so far says that that's not the only reason that, that, that causes it in, in those instances. Okay. I'm not sure, that, I'm not sure we have data that supports that either. No, I, I don't think so okay. either. Could I, could I ask, and, and I don't know if it's something we could look at, but like if part-time positions have a greater turnover rate than full-time positions, because that's another piece that we were talking about the last time, because the elementary specialists, you know, that, like, is that, does that have higher turnover because, um, again, because it's part time, we have folks that, again, we have to fill the positions as we speak. So, um, is that another piece that we could potentially look Because I would think that you certainly could show that there probably is plenty of data in that, mm -hmm. that part time positions tend to have a higher turnover rate than full-time positions and by not regionalizing our district that would be an impact because we have positions that would be either full-time or certainly closer to full-time mm -hmm. if um, if we were regionalized K-12. Good point Paul, thank you. Um, and then just two more quick things that I wanted to give you in my report is um, on communication. I just wanted to state that we had a very successful Boylston men's breakfast um, and we were able to speak about the district and some of the work that's been accomplished in our building regarding the facilities. 
We gave some staff <coughs> updates, uh, and we're also where we're currently stand in our in our current budget. So that was actually a, a nice successful breakfast, and our, my administrative team uh, joined me on that. Also. Um, we had two coffee chats in our communities and one at one coffee chat we spoke a lot about the website and we were able to pull up the new website in my office and we could navigate some of the questions and go through it so it was an interactive coffee breakfast uh, coffee chat that was fun and at our other one we the biggest discussion that we really had was the topic of regionalization and one question that did come up was um, you know how can we get the school committee to move to the next step? They feel that school committee's been stuck looking at a lot of this stuff, but how can school committee get to? And what is that next step? And and when? How can they get there? And so my recommendation uh, was to maybe have the parents speak to the school councils, speak to the school PTOs, and maybe as one voice a PTO or one talk about those pros and cons and and write a letter of you know your expectation or what you would desire for school committee to do and so I said I think the school committee would appreciate hearing the parent voice either through the PTO rather than individual emails because you'll get everybody's opinion and it'll confuse you but if you have your PTOs or you you know link or um, school councils to give you a letter to the state because uh, what we heard a lot in Berlin was actually parents just saying just whether it happens or it doesn't happen a regionalization that's not the point at this point they want to see you start to move forward to that next step get that get those committees or get those discussions happening um, so that they can, they can move forward to make that make this topic either come to fruition or put it away so that sure. was the big piece. And then one last announcement on mine um, is every year I am able through the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents, I'm able to award a superintendent's award to a graduating senior, a future graduating senior. And this year um, the uh, candidate is Jackson Danis has received the superintendent's award. So we gave him that yesterday at, at lunchtime in front of his his peers, so he was quite thrilled with that award. So that's the end of my report, and I will now go to Bob. Okay, so I have a couple of items on the agenda. The first, I'm going to order as on how was this on what was sent out. I think the first was the French River is a collaborative oil bid. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, we participate in the collaborative with uh, other members of schools in the Valley, and uh, we go in together to. Um, for multiple things, but in this case, to um, to get better pricing on oil, um, and so we just had the bid. I was at the uh, bid opening, and the um, the winning price. The company was um, in Peterson Oil this year. The winning price was bid by Petroleum Traders, dollar um, eighty three one point eight three nine, so dollar eighty four about uh, per gallon. Uh, that compares to our current pricing of a dollar. 74, 1.7395. Last year was uh, FY16 was 228, or two, actually 2.2799. So um, pricing is pretty close to last year, which, uh, or the current year, which is still very low. Um, and um, this will be um, applicable to um, Berlin and Tahanto. Boylston is not part of the collaborative. They actually don't have oil anyway. Um, so that's our pricing. One um, other thing related to that, um, I think I'll actually save a bunch of time on the last, since the other item I have is the wood pellet boiler update. At uh, about 4 or 3.30 today, we finally received the email from the state that we have a final contract document, um, 41 pages long. Uh, of it. Um, so I don't think our work is done yet. Um, I mentioned that, so uh, they're funding about 252,000 out of the 310 or so, I don't have the exact numbers right in front of me, but um, they're pr funding a vast uh, proportion of this. Uh, they want to protect their investment, I think I mentioned this last meeting, and um, they have provisions in there over 
over the first five years where they can um, claw back their investment if we don't use the wood pellet boiler and there's certain usage, usage um, ratios we need to maintain. It's um, designed and set up to exceed those usage percentages. Uh, we, to protect ourselves, requested and agreed to put in a clause that we're not penalized for downtime as long as we're trying to get the wood pellet boiler back up um, and operational. So. I think um, we have a region there to protect us. Um, the, um, the cost of oil, I think, last year was around 40000 It was more than that previously, so that was at two twenty dollars a gallon. Um, the rates we're looking at for oil right now are extremely low, but even with that, with the projected usage for the wood pellets and the pricing of wood pellets, we'd be probably at worst break even. Um, there's a range of usage that they um, project, and on the high side, uh, we would be about break even with this this lower price. So um, do we need the experience um, to run it, to operate it, and um, there's there's a potential um, lower usage as well. But this will be our first time using it. I don't know if we'll get that in the first year. Um, so, anyways, we're at the start of the next phase of the process there, and. Um, so how are they talking about the usage? Is it percent of oil versus pellet, or is it just hours of usage in a given year? How are we looking at that? They want 85 percent of our energy usage. So how they specifically are going to track that? I, yeah. I still need to read through how they're going to measure that. Um, I don't think it's based on dollars spent. It'll be, but um, the primary system will be the wood pellet boiler, right. and the um, the, the other order be a backup system they'll probably get used sporadically over the winter um, you know during very cold days so um, it's going to look at a full year or two it's not going to penalize us for January not making that number right so it's based on overall usage so like you said 85 percent is that kind of the percent ballpark we're in okay. yeah and then there's another level of threshold like if we don't use it at all but there's a 25 50 percent is a little below that so if we exceed 85 there's no issue, and which we expected. Yeah, that's what's designed and <coughs> intended to do. Okay. Interesting. Um, so, and we also just as a related note, we get um, as Berlin being a green community, we get a side benefit. I, I think that um, you know, I heard from Scott that we get grants to the tune of a couple hundred thousand dollars, it's both the town and the school, but the school pieces. Between one and two hundred thousand, I think closer to two hundred thousand. That's um, free. I mean, we—it's got to be green-related initiatives. But you know, so this kind of fits in with that. So we're getting these things by being a green community. The blue pellet boiler is a green system. Um, so I think that um, it's been a good partnership, and there is potential for additional grants in the future. Um, so it all ties together um, pretty well. Um, so that's my update on the blue pellet boiler. Thank you. So when are we, are we talking installation time for you all, or? We're going to call the contractor with the, so if you might recall, we asked for, um, for approval to contingent, get contingent acceptance of the bid based on us getting the cost here, which we did. So yeah. we have the winning bidder. Um, we've told them we're waiting from the state. Um, we'll give them a call tomorrow and say, what do we need to do to get started? It's not a quick, you know, they're okay. going to pop in and they're done. Okay. So I, I'm not sure exactly what the time frame is for installation. Um, we, we need to talk to them and meet with them. And we're obviously starting later than we wanted to. Um, we've been pushing the state for a while, uh, regularly. And um, so it's, we'd rather this have been August 1st that we're telling this, but that's where we are. <laughs> not without trying, right? right. Okay, next is the um, timeline. So I attached that. Um, it should be on the Google Drive. Um, I know that I necessarily need to read through every single thing on here, but the timeline's laid out. Um, and we're actually working right now, all of the principals as well as central office staff, on developing budgets for each of the individual schools, um, shooting to get a, a first pass in on October 28th. Um, the uh, week of November 7th to 11th, the principals are going to be meeting with uh, Nadine and I um, and um, Karen and Carol to look at the budgets. 
We're trying to keep um, incremental proposals outside the initial first pass, um, so not kind of throw things in there and have to pull out, but kind of pull them out and kind of look at running the same operation. For the most part, or be able to explain something. This, this might be things that have already changed that we can factor in that we know about. But for the most part, keep things similar and see where things shake out dollar-wise and then look at proposals that the principals have or other central office staff members have. Um, and determine how much of that you can afford. Um, and then we get into December, where um, we'll be meeting with you um, to look at where we are. Um, the Board of Selectmen and Finance Committee is in uh, February. Um, it will be working throughout that. There'll be adjustments as well. Um, and uh, we'll also be kind of monitoring our revenue estimates from the state uh, during that time as well. Um, we're all working towards the goal of the, uh, the public hearings in February um, with the region, the Berlin Memorial, Boylston, and um, we'll have a final budget presentation at the April 4th uh, Tri-School Committee meeting and the entire meeting on Monday, May 8th. May 1st, excuse me. And just, just for clarity, where Bob has the month of March and this is final budget developed uh, in preparation to for a vote at April 4th. Uh, just to I'm keep sure everybody, um, <laughs> um, just to keep everybody informed, that is the final vote that we would do. Um, if, if we needed to make any adjustments for the May meeting, but you actually have one the following week, which is that I think it's March 7th, and we'll actually do a vote there. We usually do one right after the public budget hearing. Oh, okay. so that March 7th, there's one, but the April 4th one allows us that opportunity if we need, want to make any um, recommendations. Okay. Did I just confuse you? I was looking because I didn't, for some reason, I didn't have February 27th oh. on my calendar. I think we changed the date. I think we did at the very beginning, yeah. To arrive at this date. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you, Bob. Um, Matthew Kelly? Sure. So, do you have that you have my report from after investigating the efficiency regionalization grant program? Um, I had a chance to speak to Pam Coker of the DOR who oversees the grant. And basically, I think the two key pieces of the grant are um, what you shared with me is the purpose of the grant, what we can use the funding for if we do decide to go forward, and also the idea that we need to have um, the town stakeholders involved. In, in the grant process and regionalization going forward. This is a process grant. It's not a closing grant that we've had experiences with in the past. So we are, there are two timelines for these grants. They're the first round, um, the window opened October 15th and it closes, uh, we have to send the grant by November 1st, so that's awfully tight. Um, so I would propose at this time, if we're going to go forward, to wait to round two, um, where we send the grant in by February 1st, that's the deadline. However, that being said, I would probably respectfully ask for your guidance on whether or not to go forward with this grant and to consider where we're at as a committee, I guess at this point, um, and then how to proceed getting stakeholders involved because we would probably need to do that before we send the grant again. So when is our next meeting? Because this one's going into tomorrow at this point. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, good question. Our next meeting is November 15th. So do we want to put that as a topic as well? It would have to be. Yeah. Well, I think to um, in at November, I think is when Lori would be appointing the subcommittee at that next November meeting. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, that was the discussion at the last school committee meeting. Mm -hmm. So um, that would probably be a good time of a topic to say if you're going to do that subcommittee, who would you want to invite, and then maybe discuss the purpose of this grant with that committee. Yeah. So. So we'll put that, 
Uh, Deborah, could you put that um, this CCC grant as a topic for a future agenda item? We'll go in the discussion section and we'll just go through the business items. Thank you, Carol. Yes, thank you, Carol. Carol. Next is um, John. Set me up here. Do you know my password? I do, but I didn't want to go last time. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. I only have 157 slides to show you. I'm sure oh, that's kidding. You kidding? Yeah. Ms. <laughs> Ms. Exel no. gave me a look, and she said five minutes. <laughs> well, I see Lori hasn't finished her salad, so should I get angry? <laughs> I have some leftovers. <laughs> I had to wipe the dressing off of our folders as I passed them. Well, this is trying to figure this out. Just a couple of things to pick up. Comments were made earlier about Park and MCAS and all of that. It has been a challenge, this transitional period from the old MCAS test where we found out every kid, about every kid to Park and going online, and now MCAS 2.0 staring us in the face. I tell teachers in our school on a fairly regular basis, this is a test given in a day over the course of the year. It's eight data point, and we try not to get crazed about that one piece of information. Um, it's especially important to kind of keep it in context because the test has changed a lot. We don't see as much as we used to see. That being said, it's a nice one day look at how did our kids do when every other kid in the state took basically the same test. Um, which is why we were very disappointed that we didn't get state averages this year. Um, so that's what it is. I'll give you a very quick overview of how Berlin Memorial School students did on their parking and cast test. Mostly, <coughs> I'm very excited. Um, and I will say this, I will say this in front of my good friend, Ms. Julius, over there. Teachers just did a tremendous job getting kids right. Um, they don't teach to the test, but they teach to prepare <coughs> for any test. I think that shows. So you can see here, the blue line is the state average that they don't give us anymore. <laughs> the bar graph is us. Um, and you can see third grade and ELA went, went up significantly, uh, which is what we want to see. And again, it's not, it's apples and oranges, different kids last year, but an improvement. We were pleased to see that. The same thing is true in math. The math is a huge improvement for us, one of the best scores we've ever had. Um, and I think part of that, just to kind of give a little credit where credit is due, now that the new Envisions 2.0 math program has kind of been adopted, I think we're seeing the benefits of that here. I think throughout this, we're also seeing the benefits of all the hard work that Paulson is getting us to a place where we can test online pretty much at will in our school. So our kids are very used to and comfortable with online testing. Fourth grade ELA, again, in fact, the fourth grade ELA score, that's the highest percentage of, well, level four, level five now used to be proficient or advanced. That's our best score ever. Um, so we were really excited about that. Nice job. <laughs> the same thing is true in math. Um, it is our best score ever. And we were really excited about that. Um, it was just, it, it's a tribute to kind of the growth that we've made over the course of the year. So that's all the really, really good news. And then there's fifth grade. Um, and I will say this about my friends who are now sixth graders here at Toronto, and I'm sure they're doing fabulously. Um, this group of children, for all of their strengths, and there are many, they are not kids who show their true colors in a standardized test. When they were in third grade, the third grade score went down. When they were in fourth grade, the fourth grade score went down. It's just not their cup of tea. So you can see we went down a little bit in English language arts, not a ton. In math, we went down more. Um, I will point out that, and you, if you go back and kind of look at all of the graphs in your packet, you can kind of look back and see that even though they kind of underperform our school as a whole, they did better each year. They struggled in third grade, they did a little better in fourth grade, and they did better again in fifth grade. Can I just um, stop you for one second, John? Sure. I have the numbers right here, just to give people an understanding. Um, the, in ELA, in fourth grade, it was 46. In fifth grade, it was 54. So they still made gains. And in um, math, it was 31, and they went up to 46. Right. So they've made great gains Progress. from one year. That's right. Progress. So that's what we look for. 
You know, you look for priors, but they do better every time they try. And those kids, they worked hard. They did a really nice job. With one exception. These are our science scores. Um, you remember last year, we were all very excited how well this group did in science. This is this year. 29% level four or five proficient or advanced. 29 is by far the lowest we've ever scored. And when I got them, I had that kind of sick, panicky feeling you get when you think, this is a really, really bad thing. Um, and we are, and we'll talk more as we go through, talk about things that we're doing to kind of address this. I will share this, just for the sake of brevity, I will share one fact with you. As we kind of dug into the fifth grade MCAT score, where we got a ton more information, there were two things I think you should be aware of. One is that 40% of the class missed proficient level four by one or two points in a 56 point test. Um, so there was a lot of that. And the other thing that we've noticed, and we've talked already talked a little bit about, is they struggled in the open response questions, which I thought was uh, a little unusual only because traditionally the, the writing for our school has done fairly well. Um, fifth grade science is the one thing where you can kind of dig in, and I'll give you an example of a couple of the questions the kids struggled with. There was a picture of three simple machines, a wedge and a pulley and a, a teeter-totter, and then the fourth picture was of a can opener. And they were asked, which of these is a complex machine? And more than half of them chose the pulley, because they didn't think the can opener was a machine. Because um, they'd never seen that model. You know, it was little silly things like that. One of the pictures was, it was a crane with an electromagnet holding iron over a railroad car. And they were asked, how would the engineer get the metal that was being held up by the electromagnet into the train car? Half of the kids thought that somehow the train car would become magnetic and it would pull the iron down. So those are the kinds of things we need to kind of, we're going to, have to kind of work on with, with our science program. Um, and we will talk more about kind of some of the things we're doing in, in enrichment and in our writing program to help them be a little more successful. And now being said, this is the, the, the most exciting part for our school is that we went back and looked at our growth scores for Berlin, this is a score. It's how much do kids do better than kids just like them from year to year. And you can see that for the last, geez, actually the last, um, the last three years, we can sort of, their growth scores have increased every year to the point where now this most current group, even with past those we fifth grade scores, they're in the 63rd percentile for language, English language arts, and the 57th percentile for math, which is a, a big improvement over where they've been over the last few years. And we put this one in just because Mr. Thompson and I tried to do the same kind of report. Mm -hmm. um, we looked at each of the four grades, uh, fourth grade English language arts, fourth grade math. And you can see again, a lot of progress for kids in terms of how they're growing compared to their peers. Um, so that's perfect. Anybody questions? Under five minutes. Thanks, John. Do you have anything else on your report that you wanted to? Uh, I think the only thing that I would want everybody to know is that we think that we have finally identified a special education teacher. Um, that has been a huge struggle, and Karen and Ms. Dexter have been really helpful kind of getting us through that process. So, fingers crossed. Thank you. Ace? Um, while I move the slideshow over, I'll get started on mm -hmm. so a few things on my report. I'm happy to say we have a PE teacher. <laughs> it was a long, long journey, um, but we found her. Her name is Michelle Bowen. She comes to us from New York. She just recently moved, and she's, um, she's already in the school. She's already been teaching the kids and um, taking them outside. I'll get to that <coughs> in a little bit. Um, and she's just been a wonderful addition. Uh, while I'm talking about staffing, since I initially filed my report, I have another update. Uh, we do have a resignation, uh, Sarah Richards, our music teacher, uh, has made a decision for her family. Her husband owns a business down, by, down in the Cape, and so he's been traveling. They have a young child. It's been, you know, it's been a, a real tough year for them. They were able to, to buy a house closer to, to his office. Uh, her last day is going to be November 18th. So we have posted that position. I'm in the process of 
pulling together a search committee, and I'm hopeful to, to get a parent or two on that committee as well. It's a really, you know, important, a very visual, visible position, and, um, you know, it's, I'm optimistic it's a full-time position. Uh, and I'm optimistic that we're going to fill that with the, with the right candidate. Um, I told you I'd come back to the, to the PE. Uh, the gym is still a work in progress. I like to, to come in in the morning, get my coffee, and go take a walk down there every day. They love seeing me. Um, so uh, we've seen some, some significant progress on the, on the flooring. Um, right now they're in the, in the process of putting the, the actual floor down. Uh, they, they estimate it's about a two week process and then there's a cure period and then they have to go around and do some, some additional finishing around the, the gym. Uh, the target date is the beginning of December. I'm always optimistic, I'm always pushing to, to move that up. I was going to say hopefully before the first snow, but I'm apparently <laughs> it might be too late for that already. Um, but that's, that's moving right along. Uh, the other thing I wanted to report on was just um, we made a few changes to scheduling over the summer. Uh, one of the things that, you know, it's hard to quantify what kind of effects those, those things have. One of the things we did was we moved um, the mid-morning recess to first thing in the morning. Um, and that was a big adjustment for people to kind of wrap their, their minds around. I want to share that since we did that, the tardies for the first month of school dropped 25% from the previous years, uh, from, the previous, uh, from the previous September. So I feel like if nothing else, that's a quantifiable thing that you can kind of wrap your, wrap your teeth around and shows that it's, it's helping. Um, because I'm going to try to be brief, uh, this is our, our, my baseline data report. You'll notice there's a lot of kid pictures in there. I think it's really important that we remember while we're looking at numbers and while we're looking at growth scores and everything else, the bottom line, we're talking about these kids. Uh, you know, it, it, it's really easy and it's dangerous to minimize them and to just put them as numbers. So you'll see them, you'll see them throughout the report. Um, I wanted to start with science because I'm really excited about this and I don't feel like I can take credit for it, but <laughs> I'm excited anyways. You know, I think I remember coming here for, to report at the beginning of last year, and I was, I was looking at this number down here. It's like, oh my gosh, what am I going to say? Fortunately, I, I remember exactly what I said. The, the leadership that was here before me, the central office, I feel like they already saw that trend, and my teachers really kind of jumped, jumped on it. There was a lot of conversations going on around math when I already got there. I think the other piece to remember is, especially with science, Especially with science, this is an amalgamation. This is, you know, kindergarten through fifth grade. This is their one shot. So this isn't any one grade score. This is our score of how we're doing moving to the ones. So people were recognizing the drop. We started, we brought in TCI, we brought in EIE. You know, we're continuing to work on it. A lot of the work that, that Carol's doing in terms of unpacking the new standards. You know, I'm really proud and I look to, to sustain that and to, and to, to build on that. Uh, that said, when you look at the third grade over time, I did two line, two line graphs rather than a bar graph and a line graph. You look at this middle graph, that's where the state typically is and this is where Boylston has performed. You'll notice that in third grade ELA, we're, we're doing pretty well. It's a, a little over 80 percent math. Similarly, we're, we've been solidly there at 80 percent. Not to say that I don't want to see higher than that because I do, but I am I'm pretty proud of the work that they're they're doing in there. Uh, fourth grade, we've also seen some growth, especially when you look at the math. But I'll go more. Um, we've been slowly, you know, focusing on standards, to having conversations about what's the expectations, what are they testing. I think the other thing you know when you look at 2015 to 2016 is you're looking at the second time they took the bar test. And so kids are getting comfortable. They're, they're understanding what kind of questions they're being asked and they're understanding um, the tech needs. And again, uh, you know, shout out to, to Paul for, for providing us the tools to, to bring other assessments into, into the school that are also online. 
Ace, yes. can I just ask it? I'm sorry, this no. is a really basic question. I'm not getting what the difference of the two blue lines are. So the they both state say versus four. the district. Oh. Yeah, so the, the light blue, and I really should, should have come out as different colors. Uh, the light blue is where the state is, okay. and the darker blue is where we've been over over the years. Okay. So, you know, with a couple of exceptions, we're typically above the state average, uh, but, you know, that's it's not really all we're looking for. We're looking for continuous growth. Uh, with fifth grade, this is a, an area that we spent a lot of time talking about. Uh, you can see in ELA where we're holding steady just above the, the state average. Uh, I would like to see us, uh, you know, focus, and we are focusing on the standards there. Uh, math, we've rebounded from a, a really poor performing year, but we're, again, we're not really where we're, we want to be. Made a lot of changes with the fifth grade team. I feel bad. We made some changes to the fifth grade team, uh, you know, shaking it up. We've looked at their scheduling and we've really focused our PLCs on those specific standards. Uh, every week we sit down and we talk about, okay, what are the standards that we're, we're looking for? How do we know if they've learned it? What are we going to do if they didn't? Uh, so that's a, a weekly conversation. I, I look forward to seeing where we, where we move with this, although, again, we'll be comparing a different test. So the student growth percentile, it, it doesn't look like Berlin's. Uh, you know, I started off looking at the whole school. So in this one, the blue is the ELA and the orange is red is the math. And the, these are our kids with similar scores compared to similar scored kids across the state. You know, I, we want to, I want those numbers higher. And we talk a lot about taking kids where they are and moving them forward. And we look for a year's worth of growth or more. Uh, when we, when I, I needed to dig a little bit deeper, so I started looking at you know specific grade levels and content levels. You know, I, I see we're moving in the right direction on, on some, but the, the fifth grade ELA is a place that we're having conversations about how can we how can we support those kids better and make sure that they're they're progressing along. Ace, I, I just yes. wanted just for clarification too. Mm -hmm. Remember that you're looking at two different things. The last group of graphs was a growth model and the mm -hmm. graphs before were on their achievement levels. Right. So if you look, the achievement is, there's a lot of growth on the achievement. This growth is how are they growing in comparison to their colleagues in, across the state that had the same score. So there's two different measures that you're looking at and that's what can get really confusing for people where they can analyze the information incorrectly. Um, I think that if you were to look at a cohort rather than just looking across and you look at the same cohort going across, you will see that they, the cohorts themselves have been growing. Some of our cohorts are stronger than others, so each year the actual achievement is showing a different impact. So it, it's very confusing if people aren't looking at that, and I think in all three of our schools we are seeing the achievement going up or the growth going up, we're seeing progress. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the pieces that you see in the elementary school is the extensive changes that we made three years ago in our literacy program. We're finally yeah. now, we're going into our fourth year of using it. We now have a, full, a stronger implementation of how that's being used. And Cliff, being a former administrator yourself, you know it takes three to five years to actually truly be able to rip apart that curriculum and know whether it's a tool that's being used appropriately or effectively. And I think our, our math, we've been using Envisions for nine years now, but we just got the adapted, adopted version, the 2.0 version, last year. And we're already seeing growth because it's the same curriculum, but we're able to uh, enrich it and support it with the updated materials. So I think that we're moving in the right direction in all of our schools. If I may comment, mm -hmm. I think you are moving, in, both schools are moving in the right direction. And I noticed it with John's uh, uh, presentation and yours, that you don't do the cohort piece. And I was wondering why in your present, well, no, I'm not gonna ask you that question. What I'm gonna say is, I would personally find it more helpful to have a presentation that also included the cohort 
So following the students through the grades, a, a particular class, is, is really interesting because you can demonstrate or not demonstrate, depending on the class, uh, their progress. And so I would encourage you to consider, if possible, in future presentations, to use the cohort model as part of your presentation, not in place of, but add it as another way of talking about it. No, and, and you know, and we do, we, we do. We, we have that conversation. And we have little arguments at like 9 o'clock at night about which graphs to use. And, yeah. Well, when you're having an argument about the cohort, call me. <laughs> Did she have the cohort graph? Is that it's just third grade one year, then just third four? No. So yeah. I, I know there are limitations. It's a very recent photo. Uh, just to, very recent. Let's see the pod. Just to, uh, I guess, a question for educational purposes. Um, this is like, this is what we see, this is what we have to look at. But I, un I understand there's all kinds of variables and things, mm -hmm. but it also, you know, I look at the graph with the growth percentiles and the fifth grade ELA. It, it sounds, I, I guess I want to understand mm -hmm. as a school committee, what should we be reacting to? Because I understand that different classes are different every year. That's true for everybody else that's taking these same tests. So I just want to be cautious that we're not too dismissive mm -hmm. of the, the variables that enter into it, but that we as a school committee understand when, how do we get better, or where do we really need to focus to get better, and how, how will we understand that what we're doing is the right thing, moving in the right direction? Mm -hmm. I think here, it's a very good question. And I think here we look at um, these particular data points. I think what you're hearing too is, I know even Friday afternoon, Carol, Ace, John and I are, are meeting after our Evan meeting because of some of the, the pieces that we get specifically, science, the elementary level, we're putting in elementary science where we now have new science standards, we wanna make sure we're keeping that rigor up. Because even though we've shown, we've seen growth and we've seen, it's not what we wanna be. And so that's one of the pieces we're, we're attacking um, ourselves. Um, and so we also were looking at the growth scores, um, and you saw in Peter's presentation of the six through 12, and that sixth grade had a huge jump. And then the questions that we had last year is, well, last week was, what happened with grades seven and eight? What, what's going on there? And then we pulled Peter into the conversation. You know, what, what do we need to do here? And so those conversations are happening as part of our data points and everything else and, and any of the tweaking we've done. I think with Ace, he had anticipated some of the scores that we saw were not really a surprise based on the, the benchmark testing that we had done throughout the year. And there were some changes and adjustments made right at the very beginning of the year. And then when he got these scores at the beginning of the year, he said, well, look, this validates why we did the changes that we've done. So we've been able to kind of catch some of the pieces that we see are missing just by doing our benchmark assessments. So we don't get this in October and now make the changes that we need to make. So we've been very proactive in a lot of those pieces. Um, and, and I think it's just important to to acknowledge too that all of us are having those data meetings and those conversations with our administrative team. I make them bring the data to the meetings. We talk about it with the administrator. All of those types of conversations didn't really happen that much uh, in previous years as much as they are now. We're constantly saying, what's the data? What's the data? What are you looking at? How do you know? Not feels like, seems like, but how do you know? And we're seeing that progress happening. And we're seeing that those conversations are having an end result. We are also seeing that there was a there was a concern, you know, with with a grade level, and we're talking with those staff members of let's try this approach, let's try that approach. Just last week, I had Carol buy a little resource for for some of our middle school, so that they could have it. I spoke to the middle school teachers in my walk around and said, "Hey, I'm kind of thinking that this strategy might be really helpful. They're saying, give it to me. We want to know. We want to look at it." So 
those conversations are all happening based on this, and I think, I think, in my eyes, that that's showing, because we are showing the growth. Now, I do think that doing the cohort data, kind of like what we did with the Tejanto group, would be very helpful for the future in doing this, so they can see the apples for apples, because we're not seeing apples for apples. Right, but this chart shows three out of four growth percentiles going down. Am I not reading it? Right? So what you're looking at, though, is you're looking at a different cohort of students, though, because in FY14's fifth graders are not there in FY15, and in FY15's fifth graders are not there in FY16. So you're not looking at the same student population. You don't know where their percentile rank was or where their achievement levels were the year before that would have an impact on that. So just be aware, if that's what you're showing in the school committee, that's what we're reacting I to, know. right? Yep. And so if there's something else we should be looking at, bring mm -hmm. that to us so sure. we can, because it's hard to judge that to say you're mm -hmm. seeing progress. If, if I'm just looking at that chart, mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily going to draw that conclusion. Mm -hmm. I have to say I've never seen that growth percentile approach. <coughs> Granted, I'm a dinosaur. I've been out of schools for a while, but I've never seen that approach before. I'm not quite sure what that tells us. Yeah, that, that started probably in like 2012, 2011, to have the growth percentile. Before, it just used to be achievement, remember? So yeah. you would just look at your achievement, and you wouldn't even look at a cohort achievement, really. It would just be fifth grade achievement from this year to this year, and that's what, that's what some of these charts show. But we did was it Friday? Help me out, guys. It was like Friday, right? <laughs> Friday afternoon, we all sat there. Uh, John, Diane, uh, Ace, and I, we pulled cohort data, and we were throwing all kinds of, yeah. of charts together on cohort, cohort data. There were graphs sure everywhere. We were. I'm sorry? <laughs> there were graphs everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. So, you know, we are looking at that as well. Um, oh, Sandra has a question. Sandra. Sandra. I just have a comment to make in looking at the graphs, knowing the students and the numbers. And I think that's something important that should be brought up as well. Because that fifth grade at BMS, I think, had 20 something students in it. That's, those numbers are going to look different when you have a smaller number of students taking mm -hmm. the test. If you have two kids in that test that you know, might have a little more trouble taking that test, it's going to change the way it looks as the way that whole class is. It's a good point. Yeah, that you know, you have a class of size of kids versus a class of twenty kids. Yeah. It's going to look different. Yeah, right. Different. I think that's an important number that should be given to you guys. You know that. Yeah. You know you're dealing with a different, different number size of the class. It's Thank you, Sandra. That's that's, that's that a very number. good point. Just like you know, again, when when Peter was showing his his percent his percentiles, right? He said, "Well, this is the percentage, but it was really only one student. It looked like seven percent. That's a really important one student." Point. Right, so yeah, good point. In this Thank district, you. in the class sizes, one or two students can make a big difference in how that number sure looks. Sure does. Yep, yep. Thank you. Okay. Great, great. Thanks. Um, Diane, <coughs> did you have any, give any input on the um, on Francine's presentation with math? Yeah. Francine couldn't be here this evening. Yeah, Francine is on um, on medical leave um for approximately two weeks so i will go over her reports for her the first report that you have um is the overall grade 10 uh mathematics scores we had 87 percent of our students score in proficient and advanced which breaks down to about uh 59 students in advanced and 14 students in proficient we had 11 percent or 10 students in even and then two percent in warning which is equivalent to one student so that one student will be uh, be taking the test coming up in a couple weeks um, with us. Um, it then we then have just the school achievement distribution um, by year 2013, 14, 15, and 16. But again, these, you're looking at, at different um, cohorts of students. Um, but if you do look at um, the chart um, that does go over um, the cohort, which is a, about four pages. Um, after that one, the math department took a look at the cohort group. So follow the group, um, our current juniors, last year's sophomores, from grade three all the way up through grade 10. 
Um, and you see a um, achievement in growth history of the class of 2018. And the growth of this particular class is quite impressive, especially at the advanced level obtained by um, grade 10. Um, you're looking at 75% of our students who are in advanced, 14% efficient, mm -hmm. efficient. 10% needs improvement and 1% in warning or failing, which is interesting because it's 2% on a different graph given by the state. Right, so, yeah, both pieces of information by the state. Yes. <laughs> All of them come from the state, so I don't know, 2%, 1%, 8%. Rounding errors. Um, you know, so I think that once again, um, you know, our students did very well. One, one thing that the math department did do was um, because you can do it with grade 10 MCAS is break down um, it by item analysis. And there was one particular question that sort of really gave a red flag um, that had to do with um, a interpreting a box and whisker plot um, and looking at interpreting uh, categorical and quantitative data. And that was one question that our students scored, it was the only question that our students scored below um, state average on. So that's one thing that the math department does look at specific item by item analysis and where is that sort of gap in our curriculum and, and where are we missing that so that they can, you know, obviously go ahead and improve upon that. One thing that I did want to go over um, is talk about student growth um, with students with disability. We saw an incredible growth um, in mathematics um, for students, um, you know, each year we do through a, through a grant, hold an after school MCAS program, and Francine um, runs that as well as Wesley Swenson, and it shows an impressive growth by 10 out of the 12 students in the disability, disability status category. And so, of the 22 students that attended the program, student growth percentiles range from anywhere from 16% to 99%. And only one student had a low growth of only 16%. Um, and we had six of the students score the needs improvement category, five students in proficient, and 11 students scored the <coughs> category after attending the after school program, which was amazing. Um, and the two students that showed the lowest growth had um, the least amount of attendance of those after school programs. So it, you know, it shows that we, we give that, that data to the state as well um, when we um, look at our, all of our grants and that is really, um, it's amazing. So it's, um, you know, I'd like to give props to Ms. Gleason and Mr. Swenson and the students for, you know, attending the program. Well, I think the last place they want to be is, you know, an MCAS prep after school for a couple hours. We did give them cookies. Um, <laughs> so try to get them there. Always try to part of They were healthy cookies, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> they had a lot of oats. Um, so, um, but they did do, you know, a phenomenal job. The part results, as, as Peter had talked about, they, we don't have as much, um, we don't have the item analysis, so we're not able to really take a look at, you know, what specific areas, you know, within literacy or within reading are, are students having difficulty with. Um, but with the eighth grade part results, 60% met or exceeded expectations. The median growth percentile was 56%. Um, going down to the seventh grade, we had 52% better exceeded expectations, and the median student growth percentile was 45%. And then for the sixth grade, the 66% uh, better exceeded expectations, with the growth percentile of 57%. And um, this is one area that um, I met with Peter with. I met with also the the uh, middle school um, ELA and. Um, math teachers um, to discuss, you know, what are our next steps. I think the frustration is that, um, you know, we don't have that item analysis. We don't know exactly where is it that the kids really struggled in so that we can, you know, really put some targeted interventions in. It's sort of like a, you know, our global approach with our, you know, our map, um, with our map scores and our ELA and our math labs. Um, so that is really stressful, and then you know when the kids because when the kids get up to tenth grade, let's face it, they you know this isn't just as you know as John had said, 
you know, it goes from being, you know, just another data point to being a data point which is going to determine whether or not you get your diploma. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, struggle, that's something that, it, that everybody struggles with, but I think we struggle with it more because we are 6 through 12, so we can <coughs> keep the kids. Um, and it would be great if we had that data early, you know, when they're in, you know, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, so that we're able to prepare them. But, you know, who even knows what that 10th grade test is going to look like? And I think that's what, you know, that's what is extremely, um, extremely frustrating. But, um, you know, this is something that, you know, our, the park results, it is something that we, we are um, taking a look at and why is it that we're not having, I think, the growth that we should be having. Um, and in what areas can we improve upon it? I think one of the first steps is making sure that, um, you know, all of our curriculum is aligned specifically to the standards. Um, and I think that's the, that's the first step. When we can check that off the box, we can look at other indicators. Um, one thing that I would like to add on, just add on my report, I'm, I'm pleased to <coughs> announce that our eighth grade science classes have begun their partnership with science from scientists. And I'm hearing nothing but positive things from kids and parents and Laura Hovey, the eighth grade teacher. Um, you know, it, it really is an honor to have the scientists come in and work hand in hand, in hand with our eighth grade science teacher as well as, um, as with the kids. Um, and again, the ask is Sunday. This Sunday? Go Patriots. Yes, this Sunday. <laughs> yes. Yes, um, it is. Yeah. So from 1 to 5, um, all of the uh, students, parents, community members are invited to um, our reception from 4 to 5 in the um, cafeteria. Um, but we are we're very happy that they're coming, but we'll be very happy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to follow up really quickly with the MCAS on one of your questions, um, Lori, that you, you brought up. When you go on the Department of Education website <coughs> and you see you can pull this up on any district, you go into the accountability, and if you get 75 or higher, you, you move. In, into level one, okay? We That's are growth. Eight, this is this right here, right? So meeting the gap, narrowing goals. So we met target here, and we were at 87 here. We were at 71. If that was 75, we would have met our target. If this was 75, we would have met our target. So these are the areas that we did not reach our target. Now when you go on to these pieces of um, this, this particular website, you can click right here. This is Berlin Boylston, okay, so this is Tahanka. When I click all students, what I'm looking for is where did we compare from the previous years? And what was our scores from the previous years? If you look here and our total points awarded, that means did we get bonus points for increasing <coughs> and advanced, decreasing our, our failing and warning areas. And if you look at our scores back in 2013, 525, 2014, 500, look where we were in 2016, 625 points. That's huge, okay? So when we talk about are we overall happy with where we're standing this year or where we scored this that's one of the criteria that we look at. There's so many different things that you can look at. Now we know that we still have an area to grow, but if we really look here at our student growth percentiles, we get 75 points, but extra credit, um, uh, where am I? We're narrowing the proficiency gaps, okay? Narrowing the proficiency gaps. We get 25 to 75 points on narrowing a proficiency gap. Those are the things that we're looking at. That is huge. <coughs> so now also let me go back and look at Boylston. And if I were to um, take Boylston's numbers and look where we are, we are low here, okay? But when I pull this all students and look at where we were to where we are, we also have a lot of growth. Look at our points. 
We're at 425 in 2013. We dropped down to 200, and we're up at 400 this past year. Now when I look at Berlin, and I pull the accountability again, we're definitely not where we need to be for our target, but are we making strides towards this every year? They have gone up every year. 200, 225, 300, 350. So those are the types of things that we look at on our charts too to say, are we making progress? Are we improving? How do we know? We can pull these particular areas. Now this is based on all students. If I want to go back here and look at the high needs, what do we do with the high needs? This breaks down the high needs. Where were we? Where do we need to improve more? Where do we not make the growth or the gains in high needs? Because that's the area that we need to focus on. So that helps us to see, but if we look at the all student, that's the overall arching. So it does hit with what Sandra was saying. Yeah, those students can throw off that percentile, but are we making gains overall? I hope that this area helps you, but that's what you can pull on one of the I think the whole um, difficulty for us and for everybody is figuring out what of the standardized testing, what to look at, how to, what kind of judgments to make as a result of that, if any. So we do have to rely on, you know, you folks to sort of educate us on this is really important, this is what we're doing about it, this is where we feel really good and mm -hmm. think we're doing great. Okay. All right. Next is the school committee um, to approve disclosure for travel expenses. We have two teachers, one from Boylston Elementary School, Patty Inwood, and another teacher from Tahanto, uh, Laura Settle, who will be leaving next Saturday for China. They. Um, so this is really the same process that you went through when uh, Karen and I went last year. It's considered a gift uh, from the, the Chinese Educational Bureau, Shanghai Educational Bureau, uh, because it's all expenses paid except for um, the airplane ticket, which the teachers have paid for themselves, and their visa card, which they have paid for their own visa. So we need a motion from Boylston uh, School Committee. So and do we have a motion to approve? Second. Do we have a motion first? We need a motion first. We need a motion. I thought you made the motion. I'm sorry, you were asking. I was. So move. <laughs> do we have a second? That would be me. Yeah. Um, all, any questions, comments? No. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great, and so Matt, I'm just going to pass this down so yep. you can sign that. Could we also have a motion from the Berlin Boylston Regional School Committee to approve the disclosure of travel expenses? I'll make that motion. I'll Is there second. a second? All those in favor? Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Okay, and then I'll need you are you to sign this one. Um, okay, so we have uh, just one more. Item, uh, Diana was able to uh, look at the um, enrollment classes, and we have three classes. Um, an induction to biotechnology has five students enrolled. Exploring bioethics has five students enrolled. And AP or chemistry has five students enrolled. And according, in accordance with policy IIBA, the approval of limited enrollment classes, um, we make recommendations to the school committee uh, for such classes that we can continue to hold these courses and this is required if the enrollments are of five students or less. I make a motion that we improve the limited, approve the limited enrollment classes. Is there Sorry. a second? Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Next is the resolutions. Um, so there are four resolutions. And I'm going to go through these. All of you might be familiar with 
these resolutions. The first one is the foundation budget. I recommend that you support this resolution. The foundation budget has been a calculation since before many special education programs have been put into place. Uh, these costs carry a significant strain on our budgets as a whole. And so by having the foundation budget reviewed with the committee and having them put into consideration, some of these additional costs would be beneficial for our school system. So what typically happens is you would make a motion to um, approve the resolution or disapprove the resolution. Uh, you vote on them, and since Cliff will be your representative for the region in Berlin, he would bring forward these votes at the time of the conference next week. Could I have a motion to support resolution one? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Resolution two is the tax reform. Um, I recommend support for this resolution. This resolution suggests the equity tax rate will improve schools, towns, roads, and highways. I honestly don't know enough about what this is. So they're looking at how they adjust the tax to have a tax reform. So if you are uh, higher salary, your tax would be adjusted differently than if you are a low income, and it would help to support because it would provide more equitable tax rate um, to the towns. That's the recommendation here. The recommendation is to approve. <laughs> is there a motion to approve resolution to tax reform? I'll make the motion. Is there second a second discussion? I just want to make a comment. The last, whenever I go to the day on the hill, the senators and representatives, they always talk about, um, you know, Senator Chang Diaz always talks about like a blanket analogy of there's only so much funds that has to be shared with different departments in the state. And unless you increase that blanket, there's only so much to work with. Mm -hmm. So she's said for the last few years, at some point we have to talk about taxes. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to share that comment. But this isn't explicitly stating tax reform as an increase in tax. It's mm -hmm. saying reform how taxes are assessed. Is that correct? That's correct. So that they have more equity. Fairly confident it's not about lowering taxes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that assessment is very fair. Is there any further discussion? No. Should we take a vote? All those in favor? Aye. 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 I'm abstaining from that one. Okay. Tom's abstaining. Um, resolution three, the charter school reform. I think we all know how you feel about this one. So I actually support the resolution to reject the ballot. That's the recommendation from the school super, uh, school council, um, school committee, MASC. Sorry. So the recommendation is to say no on resolution That's three. Correct. Am I understanding that? that okay. Is, well, no. The recommendation is to say yes to resolution three because resolution three is to say no to the ballot. Okay. So See, now question two. I love these double right. negatives. Right. <laughs> so, right. Like so it's a little confusing. Yeah. 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 So I guess on next to you two long. three is a no on two. Right. All right. Is there a motion to approve charter school reform? So moved. Is there a second? I second it. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. The next is the social emotional well-being of students to support this resolution. Uh, we are finding an increased need to support these individuals in our schools, and this resolution will assist us in connecting with additional outside resources to receive more supports in special needs areas. I'll move that we accept the recommendation to support the resolution. Is there a second? I second it. Is there discussion? This isn't one of those trick double negatives. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what additional outside 
Christmas. 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 Christmas.